Our next speaker is Daniel Seiler. Daniel is a student at Moore Park College, where he is a founding and active member of the newly established Philosophy Club. In April 2014, he participated in the Honors Transfer Council of California Student Research Conference at UC Irvine, where he plans to transfer. His presentation focuses on the necessity of reason over the allure of common sense. His talk today is titled, Debating Extremists, Where We Go Wrong. Let me give a warm welcome to Daniel Seiler. So I'm going to talk about some ideas. But before that, I'm going to talk about some people, starting with a man named Fred Phelps. Fred Phelps was a civil rights lawyer who focused on tearing down the old Jim Crow laws of Kansas. In 1955, he was given charge of a newly established church, splitting from the East Side Church. He named it the Westboro Baptist Church. And in 1955, he cut all ties with his former church and founded it with his family. Now in 1991, they decided to protest what they called a fag lifestyle of homosexual promiscuity that was happening in a local park. And with this, they began the campaign that has made them a household name. The church today still consists of the extended family of Fred Phelps over multiple generations, and they're up to about 40 members. Now they claim that they do these protests daily all over the country and even abroad in places such as Jordan, Canada, and even Iraq. And they've totaled over 50,000 of these demonstrations. They do these demonstrations on the sides of roads, political events, and most infamously at funerals, people such as deceased teenagers and fallen soldiers, branching signs would say things like, God hates fags, and thank God for dead soldiers. Now obviously this is a group who's put a lot of effort to try to get some attention, and they've gotten it. Out of reaction to their activities, multiple states have enacted laws and regulations about holding protests at funerals. There's the Let Them Rest in Peace Act in Illinois, and the Amer Respect for America's Fallen Heroes Act, which was signed into law by George Bush. These and the various others are rules in which the time and proximity in which demonstrations can be held. Things like you must be 300 feet away and not within 60 minutes before or after. It's an attempt to try to slow down the church, if not stop them completely, and to give those in mourning some well-deserved peace of mind. But it's proven to be ineffective. Fred Phelps, as I said, was a civil rights lawyer. Though he was disbarred, he still remained an expert in the field, and he has multiple children who are practicing attorneys. And they used their legal experience to try to push back against some of these laws under the banner of the First Amendment, which they're, of which they're big proponents. They also use their experience to avoid getting in trouble when they're operating under strict rules. The real consequence of this of almost everyone agreeing that these people's actions are so taboo that they must be stopped is that it delegitimizes this group. It makes them out to be lunatics. And when you make someone out to be a lunatic, you're labeling them in a way that makes it easy to dismiss their agenda, to not take them seriously, and to miss the point. If you don't understand what they're doing, you can't know the reasons why they're doing it. And if you don't understand that, you can't challenge them in any significant way. All you can do is try to stop their activities. All you can see is what they do. You can't see why, and you can't challenge them. Now, these people are treated in two ways. They're either treated as vile criminals or like a punchline on a late night talk show. And in spite of all of this, they've showed very few signs of slowing down. In fact, it seems that the opposite is true. In spite of all the criticism, they're unwilling to compromise on their beliefs for the sake of comfort. And this shows that they have some amount of integrity and even courage to follow through with their beliefs, no matter what anyone else says. And these are things that are uncomfortable for us to acknowledge in people that we disagree with in such a fundamental way. But we must acknowledge them because we must see them as they are, not just what we want them to be. Now, I'm going to talk about something that happened recently. The founder of this Westboro Baptist Church, Fred Phelps, 
died at the age of 84 last month. This man was vilified and condemned for his activities of protesting funerals. And now, in recent times, it has become commonplace to hear unoriginal thinkers suggest that we do the same to him, an eye for an eye. It should be a little unsettling for you to see that people who are on your side are fundamentally similar to people you consider to be your enemy. Now some of you might be wondering why it matters that we don't understand them or their beliefs. Why is it important if everyone unanimously agrees that what they're doing is wrong and ought to be stopped? Well first, to say that you don't need to listen to someone else because you know them to be wrong is to assume and to assert your own infallibility. It is to say that there's nothing that anyone else could have thought of that you have not. And no one can afford to be this arrogant. And you don't need to treat everyone else as if they're right. You do have to treat them, however, as if they could be. Secondly, it doesn't matter how many people disagree with them, just as it would not matter how many people do agree with them. Truth is not a democracy. And many commonly held beliefs today were once only held by a small minority. Let's think of ancient Greece and the virtues of democracy. In their time, they were the only nation in the world to believe that democracy was the correct form of government in the entire world. And now, democracy is seen as the most basic rights of human beings. And finally, to allow false beliefs to exist unchecked and unchallenged is to allow for the possibility that they become those small beliefs that grow and become the mainstream. Just think of the calamity that could have been avoided if the National Socialist Party of Germany had been challenged and stopped, and not just allowed to operate and grow. I would also like to remind you that things don't always get better. Let's think of ancient Greece once more. They were the only democracy of their time. And when Greece fell, the ideals of democracy fell for thousands of years. Things can get worse. We're not past anything. We haven't developed to the point of never going backwards. That can't happen. Now, I've talked about who these people are and what they do. Now I'm going to talk about why they do what they do. First, in their words, God hates fags. And secondly, they believe that America has become increasingly tolerant of homosexuals. And thirdly, they believe that because of our acceptance and tolerance of homosexuals, we're, we are becoming sinners. And we're being punished for it. So they've set out to try to warn people, to try to get those who can repent to repent. And this sounds fanatical and extreme, because we've all seen those doomsday prophets. 2012 is not that long ago. But if we take a look at why they believe these things, we'll see that there is, a, there is a rational reason for them. So they believe in the Bible, which goes without saying, because they're a Baptist organization. So the justification for their first belief also comes from the Bible. Quote, if a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination, Leviticus 20.13. And as far as their second belief goes, same-sex marriage is legal in at least 14 states, and many other states have things such as domestic partnership, which is an attempt to give all the same rights to same-sex partners in every way except in name. Third, you, and in this case the speaker is addressing God, hate all workers of iniquity. And workers of iniquity here is taken to mean those who do disgraceful things. And America, by tolerating something that God says is wrong, are thereby being disgraceful, and therefore being punished. These beliefs on their own are consistent and without contradiction, and there is some form of a rational reason behind them. And they come from two more fundamental assumptions. And I don't mean assumptions as in something that they take to be true without any justification. I mean the two things that they base the rest of their belief system off of. The first of these is that the Bible is factual. Once again, this goes without saying. They're a Christian organization. 
The second is that the way in which they interpret it is the correct way. Once again, most people believe that what they believe is right. It goes without saying. If there's any chance to challenge them in a meaningful way, this is where it happens. With the first, you can assert secular arguments. You can say you're an atheist and say why you think atheism is true or a different religion and why that religion is true. And with the second, you can assert an objective standard for interpreting the Bible. And I don't mean your standard or the one that you want to believe, but the one that you can show ought to be believed because it is the truth. Because charlatans and imposters use good logic to pervert the truth and spread error. To guard against this, we need sound logic. We can't just use numbers to suppress ideas that we don't like. That will not make them go away. We have to challenge their ideas because ideas cause actions. And if you're going to take someone's actions seriously enough that they ought to be stopped with regulations and rules, you ought to take their ideas just as seriously because they're just as detrimental. We cannot allow charlatans to have the monopoly on rational thought. We must meet them, challenge them, and defeat them with reason. Thank you.